We've come here with a purpose. We want to get our mind still. We want to, want to develop good qualities in the mind. So we've come to meditate. And as we begin to see the, the results come, we can see the happiness that comes from having a purpose. Everything we do has a purpose of one kind or another. Every movement of the mind has its purpose. Even when we try to get the mind really, really still, there's a purpose in getting it still so we can gain insight. So the insights can release the mind. There's only one thing, in, one possibility in human experience that doesn't have a purpose, and that's nibbana. That's because it's, your purpose has been achieved. But, but until that point, you have to make sure that your purposes are in line with what will actually bring happiness. Because the problem is, as we're born, we find that we have many purposes going off in many directions. It's like being tied to several different horses, all pulling in different directions all at once. One of the Buddha's images of six animals, each animal tied to a leash, and the leashes are all tied together. You've got a crocodile, you've got a monkey, you've got a hyena, you've got a snake, you've got a bird, you've got a dog. And they'll pull in different directions. We usually end up getting pulled apart. Because everything is based on desire, and we have many, many desires. And so one of the things the Buddha recommended is try to find one thing you really want more than anything else. And make that your determination. That means you're going to focus on that desire and all of the desires that are in harmony with that. As for desires that are not in harmony, you want to let them go. That way this life can be used to accomplish something. After all, you're born with a human body, you're born with a human mind. And the Buddha is saying you can use that human body and you can use that human mind to find happiness. In other words, that means that your actions do come out of your mind. They are based on your choices, and they do have results. He goes on further to say that you can actually act in a way that leads beyond action. Even though this human body and human mind are subject to aging, illness, and death, you can devote them to something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. You compare this with what some materialists say, which is that the human world is designed by physical forces over which we have no control. We think we're making choices, but we're not making the choices. We think the ones, we're the ones who decide to do this, decide to do that, but actually our bodies are being forced by physical forces. That's well, so basically saying you have a human body and you have a human mind, but you can't use them for anything. Why people would want to believe that, I have no idea, unless they just don't like the idea of being responsible. But the Buddha is saying, no, you do have the right of choice, and your choices can take you far. Now, we can't prove that to you until you get awakening. In other words, you have to take it on as a working hypothesis first, but it's a good hypothesis. Because if it is true that your actions can accomplish a lot, this is a hypothesis that doesn't get in the way, and it actually opens the way to accomplishing as much as you can. So I choose a hypothesis that closes off the doors. The problem is that our desires go in so many different directions. They can pull us left, right, up, down. And if we don't bring some order to our desires, we just go around and around and around without accomplishing anything. Think of the Buddha's knowledge of his previous lifetimes. Each time he was born with a certain appearance and a certain class of beings. He could remember the kind of pleasures he had, the kind of pains he had, the kind of food he ate, and then how he died. Over and over and over again 
birth, pleasure, pain, food, death. And as you said, going from one life to the next, it's like throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. It was only in the second watch that I went again knowledge into seeing how all beings die and then are reborn in line with their karma, that he saw the larger pattern. But even then, the larger pattern for most beings was just going around and around and around. It was only in the third watch of the night that he found that there was a way out. And that, he said, was the noble search. If you want to have a purpose for your life, he said, that's the best possible one. Because otherwise you look for happiness in things that age, grow ill, and die. And then you're back to where you were before, or worse. But if you can find something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die, that would be a worthwhile search, a worthwhile use of your life, a worthwhile purpose for your life. We think of him, we think of all the noble disciples that followed him. They devoted their lives to a good purpose. They can do it, we can do it too. But they did it by making a strong determination that this is what they wanted. And as we've learned, the Buddha said there are four elements that go into a good determination. The first one is discernment. You look at what would be a good goal, and you decide, well, the best goal possible would be one that doesn't change a happiness that you can depend on. And then you look at what you have to do in order to get there. Now, what you learn when you read the texts and think about them is you get the basic principles. But you have to get the details by actually putting the principles into practice. There are three sources for discernment. There's listening, there's thinking, and then there's developing the qualities of the mind that are talked about in what you've listened to and what you've thought about. And all three of those have to go together. Your discernment gets sharper as you put what you've learned into practice. You reflect on what you've done. See, when you get good results, when you get bad results. What can you do if there are bad results? What can you do to make them better? So discernment is a process that comes from committing yourself to the practice and reflecting what you're doing. And committing again, or reflecting again. Now, to get the most out of this process, you have to be true. True in what you're doing, and then true in your reflection. Being true to yourself about talking about what exactly did you do, and what exactly were the results you got. It's only this way that you can find the truth. In other words, what needs to be done better. And in the course of devoting yourself to this practice, there are going to be some things you have to give up. It's like planting a garden of trees. You start out, you may decide that you want to have all the trees that you like, and you might want to include some eucalyptus because they smell nice. But then you realize, you plant the eucalyptus trees, and it's got to kill everything else. A lot of trees that have more, more use. So you have to be selective. What kind of happiness you're going to go for, and what kind of happiness you're just going to say, this is not me, this is not mine. This is just pull me away from what I really want. That's a verse in the Dhammapada. The wise person sees that if there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning a lesser happiness, you're willing to abandon the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. And it sounds simple. In fact, it's so simple that the, the British translator of the Dhammapada, in one of the translations, had a footnote said, that there must be another meaning to this verse that we don't know about, because it's just too simple. Well, it may be simple as a principle, but it's not simple to practice, because all too often that Lesser happiness is something that comes quickly without effort, whereas the greater happiness requires dedication. It's going to take time. And here again, you have to bring in your discernment and your truthfulness, your discernment to remind yourself that you really do want to go for the long term, and you're going to stay true to your determination. 
So you have to learn how to talk to yourself, to get yourself past those times when there's something you really want, but it's going to get in the way of what's of higher value. This is where you have to learn how to calm the mind, which is the fourth quality of a good determination. How to talk to yourself in such a way that you're okay with abandoning the lesser happiness. You don't get upset. You don't get worked up. And you can keep in mind that you really will benefit. We hear so much about not self, and sometimes people say, well, there's nobody here to benefit from the practice. So the new Buddha never talked that way. Even when he's teaching not self, as he said, suppose someone came and was burning the leaves here in the, in the orchard. Would you say they're burning me? Of course not, because the leaves don't, aren't you and they don't belong to you. In the same way, he says, let go of what is not you or, you or yours, and that will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. So the Buddha is having you do this for your welfare and happiness. You always want to keep that in mind. And so when you have these four qualities, there's discernment, truth, relinquishment, and then calm, then you've got all the perfections covered right there. Discernment covers not only the perfection of discernment, but also the perfection of goodwill, because that's what the Buddha's discernment, what his wisdom is all about, is how to find a happiness that's totally harmless, or totally secure. When you act on that desire, it's both wise and showing a lot of goodwill for yourself. When you develop the quality of truth, there's virtue, perfection of virtue, perfection of truth, perfection of persistence. When you develop relinquishment, there's, again, more per perfection of persistence, perfection of generosity or giving, and then a perfection of relinquishment, renunciation. And then finally, as you calm the mind, there's the perfection of endurance and the perfection of equanimity. You've got all the perfections right there. So you've got the potential for what you need to put an end to suffering and to get to the other side, because that's what the word bartomy for, for perfection means. The Buddha's images of being on an unsafe shore of a river and seeing that the other shore of the river is safe, and you want to get across. So you build a raft. And what do you build a raft up from? You build it from the twigs and branches on this side of the river. In other words, the things that you've been holding on to that have been causing you to suffer, feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, you actually take them and you turn them into the path that will take you across. Like right effort, that requires a lot of a lot of thinking, a lot of fabricating of your thoughts, because you're doing this for a purpose. When the Buddha describes the aggregate of fabrication, that's what he talks about. Every fabrication is for a purpose. We're putting our lives together for a purpose already, so we might as well do a good job of it. That's what determination is for, is to take these potentials we have and say, what's the best thing we can do with them? Let's do that. And that's what will get you across.